There are three friends who are going on a hunting trip together. And two of them have gone hunting before, but a third has never been hunting before in his life. And so he says to them, hey, how do I, how do I find a deer? <laughs> and I say, all right, this is actually, it's really, it's really simple. Here, take, uh, take, take these, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, take these glasses. They, 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 they help you see through the gloom of the, uh, of the, um, of the forest, and they let you see down to the down to the tracks on the ground really easily. So you'll be able to see the tracks, nice, nice and easy. Take these glasses; they're going to help you a lot. And then the other guy says, "All right, actually, you know, uh, and take these boots too, because you know, you, you know, as you're walking through, following the tracks to the deer, you're going to need boots to keep your feet from falling off because it, it gets really painful. There's lots of lots of twigs and things. You need nice strong boots for good traction to move around through uh, through the forest." Um, and you know you're obviously going to need some way of bringing down the deer, so they hand them a rifle and they say, you know, you know, you know how these things work. Just go ahead and point and shoot, and uh, you'll you'll be able to bring down the deer. Um, all right, so he got them all loaded up with all this great gear. He's all he's all set to go. So they go out on on their hunting trip, and they're all at base camp. They say, all right, let's each go out and see who brings back the biggest deer. They're all excited. They're, okay, okay, let's go. So they all go out. Guy one and two come back into camp at roughly the same time. They're each dragging a, a big old a big old deer with them. It is hunting season, it's all legal, it's fine. Um, <laughs> big old deer with them. Plop them down, they say, oh, very nice, very nice. Hey, how'd you, how'd you bag your deer? Yeah, you know, guy number two goes, well, you know, I, I was really simple, I was in the forest and I saw some tracks, you know, I followed the tracks, followed the tracks, followed the tracks, bam, hit a deer, it's great, got it. Goes, how'd you find your deer? Oh, pretty same story, actually. I, uh, you know, same thing in the forest, and I saw some tracks on the ground, so I followed the tracks, followed the tracks, followed the tracks, bam, hit my deer. Got it right, got, got it, got it perfect. It's great. All right. hope, hope guy number three is doing well. They sit there for a little while, maybe an hour goes by, maybe two, maybe three. Finally, that's just as they're about to go out and check for their friend, he comes crawling back into camp battered, bruised, so many bones broken on this poor man. Um, and they like, oh my goodness, what, what, what happened? What happened? Are you okay? What happened? He looks up and he goes, oi, it was horrible. I was in the woods, I saw some tracks, so I followed the tracks, followed the tracks, followed the tracks, bam, I hit a train. <laughs> <laughs> and the moral of this story <laughs> It is important to follow the right tracks. <laughs> so often within the church, uh, I think we want to teach people just enough in order for them to get hit by a train. In this way, I think we resemble very much the Jews of Paul's day. If you would open with me to Romans chapter 10. So Romans chapter 10, uh, we've just started in Romans 10. Again, we've gone through all of Romans to this point, Paul's description of the gospel. Uh, Romans 9 was a lot of fun, uh, where uh, Paul walks us through that it is, is again, it is not by birth, uh, birthright or benefit or works that we are saved, but by the grace of God. <clears throat> in Romans 10, uh, we talked last week again about, you know, what is Paul's heart? What is Paul's heart for his brothers and sisters uh, of the Jewish race? And he says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Right? Bear witness, they have a zeal for God. And we talked last week about uh, how, how many people, even in today's day and age, they have a zeal, a zeal before them for, for what they believe is good, what they believe is the, the highest good worth pursuing. Uh, of course, we also know the truth that if that highest good, if we are focusing ourselves in total pursuit on anything other than God, uh, we are going to be left disappointed, we're going to be left without achieving the goal, and we're going to be left in a world that is darker than when we began. Excuse me. And so, this is the nature of the lost, that there is a great zeal for something. All people, we believe, uh, were made in the image of God, and therefore all people were made with a longing to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to worship in some way, to worship something higher than themselves. 
Um, now, again, we believe that the only proper object of our worship is the Lord, is God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Um, and yet, the lost are also designed for a longing to worship something greater than themselves, whatever that may be. It could be gender studies, it could be money, it could be status, it could be reputation, it could be, uh, it could be feeding the homeless, like even something good, if worship, uh, if, if seen as the only thing that is going to make me good, to make me valuable, to make me righteous, this too will come up empty for you, and you will actually not achieve the goal that you set out to achieve. So this is the nature of the lost in our world. Everyone is looking for something. Now then, if that is the case, we as the church, we know what deer tracks look like. We know how to find the deer. And if all we are doing is outfitting people with better ways of pursuing what they're looking for without ever actually directing them to what they should be looking for, mm -hmm. then we are just guiding them to get hit by a train. Mm -hmm. And that is... Uh, that, that's where Paul is going in these next verses of Romans chapter 10. So we're going to begin <laughs> in verse 5. Actually, I'll start reading from verse 4 for a little bit of context, and we'll go through verse 10 today. We ended last week with this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. We talked about that end is both the termination of the judgment under the law that we have, and Christ is the fulfillment of that law. Christ is the fulfillment, he is the end. <clears throat> so for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Beginning in verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says this, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, but that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. <clears throat> that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word that you have given to us. May it be that we study it faithfully, we are edified by it, encouraged by it, rebuked by it where necessary, and we take these things and bring them out into our lives even after this time of study. May your name be glorified more and more on account of the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we'll start, with you. We'll start here with verse 5. The first thing we see here that Paul is talking about, verses 5 through 7, uh, he makes the point that Jesus did not come to point to the law. Jesus did not come to point to the law. So, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. The person who does the commandments shall live by them. This is a reference to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, where... Moses says this, <laughs> the, the you who do these commandments will live by them. And of course, this is a reminder in, in the grand scheme of the gospel here that it is only by doing the commandments, not doing a commandment that you will find life, doing the commandments. If you do all of them, you will find life. You will be righteous. You will be just before God. Uh, and again, it should go without saying, if I ask everyone to raise their hand, all who have obeyed all the commandments of God at all times, uh, I'm not going to see a single hand in this room, and I will not see a single hand from any honest person uh, throughout the entirety of the earth through history, except for one guy, <laughs> maybe Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so that's that's the point there. He says, if you if Paul is making the point again, he's reinforcing this again and again. If you are trying to find righteousness by the law, trying to find the righteousness by some ethical standard, uh, let alone the perfect ethical standard, you will fail because it is impossible for you to achieve. Uh, and so that is the righteousness that is by the law. What does that say? If you do the commandments, uh, then you will live by them. But, Paul says, the righteousness based on faith says this. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or, who will descend, descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. 
Now we read these verses, and at first blush, what do we think they mean? It looks like to us, what this means is, do not try to guess who among you is going to go, is going to be saved and who is not. And first of all, for the record, that is a good thing to do. Do not try to guess who among you is going to heaven, who among you is not. Don't do that. That's God's job. However, that is actually not at all <laughs> what these verses are trying to say. Um, they come from, so Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy. He is quoting, uh, specifically the quotations are these. Uh, do, do not say into your heart who will ascend into heaven. Do not say in your heart who will descend into the abyss. These are from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. I'm uh, sorry, verse 12 and 13. Um, and I'll go ahead and read that here. Starting in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 30, uh, Moses is saying this to the Israel, uh, to, to the Israel, to the Israelites. For this commandment, which I am commanding you today, this commandment that he's referring to is the law of God. This commandment, which I'm commanding you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it far away. It is not in heaven that you could say, who will go up and go up to heaven and get it for us to proclaim to us so that we may follow it. Nor is it beyond the sea or the abyss that you could say, who will cross the sea for us to get it uh, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. So this is, this is the context of what is, what, what, what's happening here. Basically, what Moses is saying in the context of Deuteronomy 30 is, I'm telling you the, the law of God. I'm telling you the commandment. I'm giving you the law that he's given me. Uh, it is not difficult to understand. Yes, there are 613 laws. However, there are really, there are, there are 10 big ones that are, are off of which everything else is pretty much based. He's saying the law is actually relatively easy to remember. You have it written down, first of all, uh, and uh, you have it in community. I have presented it to you now twice because Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. He is presenting it, it's the same law, he's presenting it a second time. So I've given it to you now twice. You've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. We've been talking about it nonstop. We, we study it frequently. It's written down. You parents are charged with telling your children about it and passing it down through family generations, you have all these tools to remember the law. It is not difficult for you to remember what the law is. You don't have to say, who's going to go up into heaven and have God bring us the law back down so we can follow it. You have it. You can follow it. Or you can, you can try to do your best to follow it. And you, you do not have to say, who will go across the Mediterranean Sea and find some wise person to bring us this law. You have it. It's been given to you now twice. You are passing it down through generations. You are encouraging one another in it. It is, again, for the third time, written down for you to have. It is near you. Now, why is Moses bringing this up? It's because this Moses is dying. Moses is about to die. This is only a, a couple of chapters prior to the death of Moses. Moses was the lawgiver. Moses was the one that everyone looked up to. He was the, 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 the leader, the earthly leader of Israel. And he is about to die. And so he is saying, look, I'm going to be gone soon. You don't have to send, send somebody up to heaven to get me to bring it back to you. You don't, you, don't have look, you don't have to go out and look for someone who's just as wise as I am. God <coughs> has given you the law for you to know and to pass down through generations and to, to have near you, to write on your hearts this law that I've given you. You don't need to come find me to get it. You don't need to go find somebody else to get it. You have it. That is what Moses was saying in Deuteronomy chapter 30. How does Paul use <coughs> those principles from Moses? <clears throat> Excuse me. So Paul says, he, he adds in these words. Uh, do not say who will go up into heaven, uh, for that is to bring Christ down. And, who, and do not say who will go into the deep or into the abyss, but that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What Paul has done here, as with most things that Paul writes, I've written everything that Paul writes, because not only was he intelligent, but the Holy Spirit is pretty smart as well. <laughs> it's just brilliant. The commandment, the word, that's another word for the commandment here in, in, in Deuteronomy 30, the word given to you says Moses, is not hard. It is not far from you. It is not. It, it is near you. It is written on your heart. You have it with you. You don't have to go and find it. What do we know from John chapter 1? 
The word was God, and the word was with God. Nothing has been made that was not made through the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus is the word incarnate. Jesus is the fulfillment of the commandment, like we just saw last week, he is the end of the law for righteousness. He is the word, as the commandments were the word. And so when, what Paul is doing here is he is, again, seeing it through the lens of the full truth that has been revealed to us through Christ Jesus. He is saying, do not say, <clears throat> excuse me, do not say, we need, to, we, we need to send somebody up into heaven to bring Jesus back to us so he can explain the gospel to us again. Do not say we need to send somebody across the sea or down into the deep to bring Jesus back up from the dead to explain to us again what the gospel is. Paul's point here is, you know it. It has been preached to you. The spirit is in you. It is written on your hearts. It is simple. It is not complex such that we have to go and get the person who brought us the gospel and bring it back. He gave it to the apostles. He gave it to you. He gave it to me. I've given it to you. This is the same gospel around which we are unified. Excuse me. And so all of this to say, Paul is saying that Jesus did not come to testify to the law but rather, Jesus came to testify to himself. Jesus came to testify to the gospel. Now I ask you, brothers and sisters, in what ways do you testify to the law in your Christian walk? In what ways do you testify to the law? Do you follow that not, do you follow that tenet that sounds like it might be from the Bible, but certainly is not, of only help those who help themselves? People will actually quote that as saying, like, oh, yeah, this is God, God only helps those who help themselves, um, which did not come from the Bible. It came from Aesop and his fables. <laughs> but people will say that. So do you, do, you, do you find yourself doing that? Oh, I'm not really going, if a person is in need, I'm not really going to help them unless they show me that they're going to try. And unless they show me that they're actually trying to, to better themselves first, then I'll help them. If so, then you would assign some lawful standard based on which you are sharing the hope of Christ with that person. Sharing the one person. May it never be. If, God, if, if Christ had set that standard up for us, he would have shared the gospel with no one. Do you find that you hear a politician in the news or, uh, or on some podcast who you really, like they're saying all the things that you, you want to hear and you, you say to yourself, that right there, that's a good man. That's a good woman. That's a good person. As soon as you do that, as soon as you make that moral jump from I agree with their policies to that's a good person right there then what do you do? You tend to sort of absorb anything that they say without actually critically thinking about it. Ooh, Ron DeSantis said something good recently. Yeah, great. What a good guy. Ron DeSantis a few weeks later says something a little bit, a little bit bonkers, a little bit crazy, a little bit not on board with, with what the gospel is. <clears throat> oh yeah, man, he, that, must be, that must be right because Ron DeSantis said it. I'm using him because I like Ron DeSantis. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, when a non-Christian or when an unbeliever or a lost person is having some problem or is in need, is the first thing that you jump to training them up in behavioral modification, telling them, oh, you're doing this thing, but you shouldn't do that thing. You should do this thing instead. For example, if they're, if they're, uh, they're a non-believer and they're having financial woes, so it's your first step to, okay, let me teach you how to budget. Uh, and, and get the, get all these things in order, and so you can you can you know your heart's desire with your money you'll you'll, you'll have. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. I'm saying is that your first uh, is that your first jump to go to thing? Is that the ultimate thing that you're gonna that you say to yourself? I'm gonna get this person up, and they're gonna be good to go. And then as soon as they're financially uh, financially what do you call it uh, literate, they're good. They're all set. They don't need anything more. 
know, we've missed a little bit of, you know, they also, if they're a non-believer, they also need this thing called the gospel. <clears throat> and this one, this one, I, I had to say strictly to my, uh, very much to myself, when you fail in your Christian walk and you do what you don't want to do and you don't do what you do want to do, got to work it in every time. <laughs> when you fail in your Christian walk and you do what you don't want to do, you don't do what you do want to do, do you respond with self-hatred? Do you respond with, oh, I, I messed up again. I, I, I did something. I, I actually encountered this in myself even this past week. I, I told my wife I was going to do something. Uh, I, I tried to let my yes be yes, and my no be no. I said, I'm going to let, I'm going to do this thing for you, Jenny, and totally forgot to do it. And then when she pointed out that I had forgotten to do it, what did I do? I melted down against myself. It's like, oh my goodness, what a worthless pile of flesh you are. Um, do you respond with self-hatred? Because when I do that, what happens? What am I showing people around me? What am I showing myself? Well, to myself, what am I proclaiming? I am, I am unforgivable. What am I showing to other people? In order to be valuable, in order to be good in the eyes of God, I have to be perfect. Because that's what I'm saying. Like if I get that, if I get that messed up about a mistake that I make, about a sin that I make, and acknowledging that we, we should grieve our sin, we should do that, we should feel badly about it, but if we respond with like the self-hatred and screaming at ourselves and making sure that everyone around us knows that we know I messed up, then what are you actually doing there? You're actually just trying to prove to people how holy you are because you know how badly you've done messed up, as opposed to actually just seeking the forgiveness of the Lord. You are you are holding your standard up against the law as opposed to recognizing that in your mistake, you are forgiven. And in what other ways do you in your Christian walk testify to the law rather than the gospel? When we live in this way, we show people, we teach people just enough for them to be hit by the train. When we live in this way, we testify to the law alone and not to the man to which the law was pointing. So we see in verse 8. But what does it say? So the righteousness based on faith, this is verse 6 again, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven or who will ascend into the abyss. But what does it say? What does the law of faith say? So it doesn't say those things. It doesn't say go and try to go and testify to the law. It says, verse eight again, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. And this again, directly from Deuteronomy 30, 14. So this is the, this is the verse right after what he had just quoted. Um, Excuse me. And so, again, in context, on the contrary, the word is very near you, in your mouth, and in your heart, that you may follow it, says Moses. So Moses' point in Deuteronomy is simply that Israel, like I said before, would be able to remember the law. They had the text, they had each other, they had their families, they were instructed to write the law on their hearts and to remember it as a nation. Through these institutions, the law would be passed down from generation to generation and proclaimed through their land and the land of the Gentile nations. It would be spread by Israel living out the law that they remembered. That was the idea. That was the idea from, from Moses. And Paul actually, again, uh, applies this to the gospel in his passage. And this, again, it's just, it's so beautiful. It's so brilliant. <laughs> Paul applies to the gospel in this way. When we remember the law, we remember the whole law. When we remember the law, we remember the whole law. And the whole law begins with the commandment and concludes in its fulfillment. And actually, we can see this even from Jewish uh, rabbis and philosophers. There's a Jewish rabbi I very much enjoy reading from the early 20th, throughout the 20th century. His name is Abraham Joshua Heschel. I've referenced him before. And he writes this, he says, a commandment is a foresight, a deed is a fulfillment. The deed completes the event. The giving of the law 
is but a beginning. Our deeds must continue, our lives must complete it. So that's the Jewish view of the law. I'm going to say immediately up front, Paul takes this an extra step and, makes it, and creates a Christian view. But the Jewish view of the law is this. The commandment was given, but the commandment is actually only fulfilled. The law is only fulfilled when we follow it. Just knowing the law is insufficient. We must follow it for the law to be complete. That is a proper Jewish understanding of the law. Paul agrees with almost everything that Heschel writes there. However, Paul knows that the end of the law, the goal of the law, the fulfillment of the law, is Jesus the Christ, not our ability to follow it perfectly. And so a Jewish person would look at the law and say, the law is fulfilled when we follow it. We have the responsibility to fulfill the law in its entirety. The Christian says, I agree, we have that responsibility, but Christ achieved it for us. Excuse me. So Paul's whole point, and like I say, that's, that's why we have in verse 4, for Christ is the end. Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so when Paul writes, the word is near you, uh, when he's quoting Moses, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That's what he's saying. Paul has already made the, made the claim, Jesus is that word. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law that Moses was talking about. This goes all the way back to the law of Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of that law. So when he says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, he means Jesus is near you. You don't need to go into heaven to find him again. You don't need to die to go find him in the depths of the sea. You don't need to go to some distant part of the, a part of the world to find him. He is in you. He is near you. By his spirit, he is within you. That is the gospel. And again, that truth, that truth of the gospel, we as Christians, we are not, we are no longer called as Christians to memorize the law of Moses and pass it down through generation to generation and in such a way that all of our children are following it as best we can. We are called as Christians, first and foremost, to bring up our children, to, to use the institutions that we have, the church, our family, our fellowship with one another, to remember the gospel, to remember that Christ has fulfilled the law and he is righteousness for all who believe. That is what we're called to. Israel was called to remember the whole law and follow it to the best of their ability. We are called to remember the fulfillment of the law and follow him, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him daily. <clears throat> that, brothers and sisters, that salvation, that faith, that righteousness through Christ, that fulfillment of the law, that, as Paul says here, is the word of faith that we proclaim. So we finish out here in verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be <laughs> saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is <clears throat> saved. The message is simple. This is the gospel we preach. This is the gospel we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is an expression of the gospel in its simplest form. Does that sound horrifyingly complex to remember? Does it sound like something that you need to spend years studying to remember those words, to remember that truth? That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm not saying it is absolutely simple to follow. I am saying it is absolutely simple to remember. Right, brothers and sisters? Amen. Amen.
So what are the things, what are the elements of the gospel here that we see? What are the actions taken? Uh, for those of you who have been studying in Genesis with me, what are the verb words that we see here? <laughs> believe and declare. <clears throat> believe and declare, and you will be saved. Believe and declare. Okay, believe. Uh, the word in the Greek, believe, we often, and again, I, I, I'll, I'll harp on this until the cows come home, uh, because believe is not, I intellectually understand. Believe is trust. Believe is trust. That's, that's what the word means in Greek. It, has, it literally means, I trust in this thing. I trust in this truth. I trust in this proposition. So to understand something and to believe it are two very different things. Again, I come back to the idea of the guy up on, um, uh, up on the, 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 high, the high wire on the unicycle. And he says, who, who, who believes that I can get across this thing? Oh yeah, we all believe. So he goes and he comes back. Who believes I can do it carrying some weights? Oh, we believe. He goes and comes back. Who believes I can do it with one of you on my shoulders? Oh, we believe you can do it. All right, who's hopping on my shoulders? <laughs> Everyone quiets down. <laughs> True belief is the guy who hops up on the shoulders, right? It's the guy who I say I, 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 I say I believe it, but again, it's, 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 it's more than just an intellectual understanding. It's more than just a quick little ascent. It is trust. I trust. But by getting on the unicycle of shoulders, I'm going to get there and back safely. And so if you believe, believe in your heart, excuse me, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that is what we are told to believe. We're not believing in the unicyclist, we're believing what? We believe that, we trust that God raised Jesus from the dead. I will say this again. The Christian faith is the only one that depends on a falsifiable claim, falsifiable historical claim. And what I mean by that not is it is false. I mean, it is a historical claim. If it didn't happen, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul says the words for us, then we are greatly among men to be pitied because we are here for nothing. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are here for nothing. But if he did, if we trust that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God, then it is the single, absolutely most important event in human history. It changes everything. If Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. Because not only do we have to attach to, you know, okay, did Jesus rise from the dead? Sure, but you know, Great, he rose from the dead. That is the meaning of the thing. Well, it does mean something. A, it means that our sins have been paid for, and, and, and we believe that uh, we, we have the hope of Christ and the resurrection with him through God, because he's proven his power over death. But also along with that, it proves that if Jesus was raised from the dead by God, then that means that God is saying that this guy and all the things that he said were correct, right? If God is going to go out of his way to raise someone from the dead, who made claims about himself, I am God, you who believe in me will be saved, then God is giving his approval to everything that that man said. Right? And so if we trust that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we can trust in all the promises that Jesus made throughout his, his earthly ministry and earthly life. Because God affirms those things. And again, Jesus is God. I'm just, I'm referring to raising of the earthly, the earthly body. So that's the trust we're talking about. That's the trust that we, that we have. We trust that God raised Jesus from the dead. The nice thing about trust is that it cannot actually be faked. The nice thing about belief is it cannot actually be faked. You can claim to believe something or another, uh, but that doesn't actually mean that you actually believe in that thing. It cannot be faked. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord does not look at the outward appearance of a man. Instead, he looks at the heart. So can't be faked. God knows if you believe or not, period. He's the judge of that. So if you believe in your heart that, that Jesus was raised by God from the dead, that's part one. What's part two? Declare. Uh, and the, the word declare here means publicly stating your agreement. Publicly stating your agreement. Uh, and so what are you what are you stating that you agree with? You are stating that you agree with these words. You confess with your mouth, you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. 
Again, this is very simple to understand. You declare with your mouth, you publicly state your agreement that Jesus is Lord. <coughs> Ultimately, this declaration, this confession, this is always must be the first act of true belief. If you have not declared it, you have not fully believed it. If you have not declared it, you have not fully trusted it. And I liken it to, and again, this, this, uh, um, excuse me. Yeah, I think because a, a, a common, uh, a common, what do you call it, objection to this is the idea, well, no, it's, we are saved by grace through faith. Well, yes, but if you truly have the faith, you will declare, you will confess. I liken it to the idea of I'm sitting on a park bench with Jenny and Isaac, and all of a sudden, I have the absolute firm belief that a cruise missile is headed towards us. What am I going to do? I'm going to pick up my wife and child and try to get us out of the blast radius, right? If I truly believe that, then I'm going to act on it. Now, if I say, oh, I believe that a cruise missile is heading towards us, yeah, and I do nothing, what does that show, Jen, about my belief? I don't actually believe anything, do I? <laughs> I don't actually believe a cruise missile is coming. And so that's why Paul is connecting here the confession to true belief, is because if you are wondering, do I truly believe? Are you earnestly confessing Jesus is Lord? Jesus is Lord. And again, those words are fakeable. You can say those words. God knows your heart. You can say those words and not mean them. But to say those words and mean them uh, is, is that, I mean, that, that is the gospel. You say these words and you mean them because in your heart you believe that the Lord raised, raised Jesus from the dead. You are saved. Period. And the, the great, I think the great part about those words, and again, it's just so, it's so great, it's so brilliant. <laughs> By declaring Jesus is Lord, so back in, back in Paul's time, if you say Jesus is Lord, what are you saying? I, my allegiance is to Jesus over the emperor of Rome. There are consequences for this. That is called treason and even heresy in the Roman world. Yeah. Now, if you say in today's world, Jesus is Lord, and you, you earnestly say that in the public sphere, you publicly confess, you publicly declare, Jesus is Lord. Brothers and sisters, saying that is different than saying I'm a Christian in today's day and age. Mm. If you say I'm a Christian, all that can mean to people is I went to church when I was growing up twice a year. Like that's, that's, that might be all it means. It might be I was in church until I was eight years old and my parents got tired of it, but you know they told me I was a Christian when I was six, so I'm a Christian. That's all it might mean. But if you, if, you, if you are to declare in the public sphere, if you are to say and affirm and agree with the statement, Jesus is Lord, that is different in our modern day than saying I'm a Christian. That is saying, how am I ordering my life? You are, you are, you are saying in those words, Jesus, if he is Lord, then he is God, because there is no higher authority, there's no higher lordship than God himself. If you're saying Jesus is Lord, you are saying to a modern audience, I believe there is a God, I believe he is personal, and I believe that Jesus of Nazareth, who lived on this earth 2,000 years ago, is God, and he is Lord. And by saying the word Lord, you're also saying, and I am his servant. I am giving up of my libertarian free will to follow this man, not whatever self-actualizing I, I, I want in my life not my own desires, not my own passions. I am giving up my will to follow him, to deny myself, pick up my cross and follow him daily. Those are the words that we're called to say. We're not called to say, I'm a Christian. We're called to say, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and he is Lord. That is the gospel we preach. There will be consequences socially, socially more today. Um, there may be a time coming where those, those social consequences become life and death consequences in this nation, but I don't see it anytime really soon. Could be terribly wrong on that. There are consequences. You will be ridiculed. You will be put to shame. You will be called a fool. 
And again, this comes back to the thesis statement of Romans. But we, brothers and sisters, this is the gospel we preach, and we are not ashamed of it because we believe that Jesus did rise from the dead, and we believe that fact does change everything. You have tried to follow your conscience. You have tried to do good. You have tried to prove your worth in this world, and you have failed. Every single one of you, myself included. But God became a man. He lived and he died, and he rose again for your sins to give you life. Believe that his resurrection was true and that it changes everything. And brothers and sisters, go and tell the world what you have found. You found the deer. You found the thing that we were made to look for, which is God in relationship with him through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the gospel we preach. And so how then do we do we orient ourselves towards the lost? Because that, that was sort of the, the question that I originally planned to ask explicitly uh, in, this, in this sermon. How does, that, how does that affect the way that we approach the lost? And then I asked earlier, in the earlier section, how, how do you testify to the law rather than to the gospel? Now I'll ask, I'll ask this question. Does this mean that we don't have to convince the lost that living the right way is important? Does this mean we don't have to convince the lost that living the right way is important? Yes, it does mean that. Let me explain. Do we still offer help to those in need? Yes, absolutely. Should we still offer to teach people better behavior, whether they're Christian or not? Yes, yes absolutely. These are ways that we live out Christ's lordship in love. These are ways that we, that we say to other people, Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. What does he say in Matthew 25? He says, what you have done for the least of these, you have done for me, says Jesus. What you have not done for the least of these, you have not done for me. We are submitting to his lordship by meeting the needs of those around us by praying for those around us, by teaching people better ways of living to those around us. We do these, the, th the, the, the these things we do for others, whether they're convinced of the right way to live or not. Like whether they're convinced that to follow Jesus and to do all these things is the best thing for them. These are still things that we offer. These are still things that we, that we do for others, right? In submission to the words of Christ. However, when we set out to convince, to first convince people to live the right way, we are demanding that they do something for righteousness. When we first go to that, when that's our first thing that we try to do, is get a person to live right before directing them to the gospel, before directing them to Christ Jesus. And we are asking them to do something for us, to do something for righteousness which again is so counter to the gospel, uh, you'd have to read through Romans one through 10 to get to, to, to realize that again. You can see it on every page. <clears throat> when we do that, we are asking them to submit to our Lordship before they have submitted to and declared Christ's Lordship. I wanna be very, very clear. This is not to say we don't, this is, this is not a matter of action. We are not, we're, I'm not saying don't go out and help people and teach people the right way to go, teach people how to, how how to deal with their finances, teach people good things. What I'm saying is, why are you doing those things and how are you doing those things? If you're doing them because you, you, you want to get them to the, get them to a point where they're ready for the gospel, then you are deceiving yourself about what the gospel is. If you're doing it in a way that forces them to follow these things before you tell them about Jesus, then you are, you are not living in lordship to Christ. With, you, are, you are not living Christ's lordship. If you are doing these things because Christ has called you to serve others at your expense with your time, energy, and resources, to deny yourself daily, pick up your cross, and follow him, great. If that's why you're doing those things, fantastic. If it's for some other reason, question it. 
go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> so that might be a more personal note. And as we close, I have this for we as a congregation here at New Hope Christian Fellowship. We have come this far in Romans. We know what we were that is dead in sin. We know what God has done to reconcile us to himself. He became a man, died on the cross for us. We know that we've been freed from slavery to sin through Christ's resurrection. We know that we are now children of the living God and no longer bound to sin. We know that we will never be separated from his love. We know that, there, that many are still hardened in their hearts towards Jesus. We know that everyone deep down in their bones needs God and needs God's righteousness. And we know that righteousness comes by grace through belief and declaration of Jesus' life and lordship. So we know those things. What is next for this little church? We're coming into the building in the next few, we hope, few months. <laughs> we exist in Bedford. We are friends with ministries in Manchester and Milford, but we have, we, as New Hope Christian Fellowship, we have been called and positioned by God and his grace and his time mm. to minister to the people of Bedford. Mm. Again, this is, to say, is this to say I shouldn't go and help Emmaus with things? No, you should do that. But we as New Hope are called to the people of Bedford because that's where we are. <clears throat> so who do we want to tell about this thing that we have found? Who do we want to tell about this thing that we have found in Jesus Christ? Everyone. Everyone. Thank you for saying that. That was actually the next word on my on my on my sheet. <laughs> now we say everyone, and this is this is a true statement. However, again, I don't want to I don't want to say this is not true. We do we do want to bring it to everyone. However, we as New Hope, as we are as we are thinking about how we are to minister in in in, in Bedford, by saying everyone, sometimes. Just knowing this about myself, we use the broad phrase to escape trying to come up with a plan. <laughs> right? Who do we want to minister to? Everyone. Oh, good. Great. All right. Meeting's over. We're good. Let's just go talk to everybody. How are you going to talk to six billion people? Well, exactly. <laughs> so I ask, I ask you this. I'm asking this to each individual person. Whom do you want to reach in Bedford? Do you, have a, do you have a person in mind? If so, great, share the gospel with them. If you have a group of people, could it be, are we talking about like students? Are we talking about uh, professionals, business people? Are we talking about a, 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 a poorer homeless population within the bounds of Bedford? Are we talking about uh, those living up in the, in the mansions of the wine streets of Bedford. Are we talking about, like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about, are we talking about scouts? Are we talking about outdoorsy people? Are we talking about, what are we talking about? Whom do you want to talk to? Whom do you want to reach in the city of Bedford? I want you to think about that. I want you to pray about that. Once you come up with that answer, I have a second question for you. How? Do you want to reach these people? Think about that. Pray about that. But Will, I mean, you're, you're the leader, you're the pastor of the church, and Alan's the elder. Are we coming up with all the things ourselves? No. But <laughs> if the Lord is putting on your heart somebody, some group of people or some person that you want to ensure that is reached with the gospel within the town of Bedford, tell that to the church. Tell that to the church, to us, here, all of us, Alan, me, your brothers and sisters in Christ. We, you as an individual, are weak and pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> we, as the body of Christ, are moved by the Holy Spirit and gifted for many different things. If there is somebody who, if there is some person or some group that we, that we need to reach out to using, using the resources, the giftings that we have, we are called to, and again, everyone is the correct answer. But if let's 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 find someone to tell about Jesus, guys. And this is not to the exclusion of your own personal lives, your own personal walk. Like as you're going through life, you're going to be talking with people and living out the gospel. Share the gospel with them. Invite them to church. <laughs> Most importantly, though, just share the gospel with them. 
preach the gospel always when necessary, use words. Brothers and sisters, using words are far more necessary than we like to believe. It's a good phrase, it's a good adage, but sometimes we use it in order to not actually talk about it. <clears throat> we are going to have uh, a base of operations soon that it's not just one of our houses. Uh, and your leadership, that is Alan and me and any others who come on board, we will do our best to guide this church in spreading the gospel wherever we are called. But this is not something that just Alan and I are called to. This is something that we as the church are called to. To share that gospel, to show people the right tracks to follow and how to find the deer. And show people the path to the thing that they've been looking for is Jesus the Christ, sacrificed on a cross, raised again on the third day, <clears throat> Lord over our lives. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have this calling on all churches as we are going to make disciples of all nations. You have placed us in Bedford, in this part of this nation. You have given us the gospel. It is not far from us. It is simple. It is beautiful. It changes lives by your power and your grace. Help us to fully declare and believe that more and more in our community, in our city, in our town, in our personal and interpersonal relationships, in our families and with our friends. Not to point to our behaviors, not to point to the law or some ethical standard of living and doing good, but to point ultimately to you. In your son's holy name, amen. amen.